All right, here I am. I'm muted <laughs> at last. Okay, so welcome to our theme, taking a deep dive. As we know, this has been our theme all year long and it has worked for us. We are going deeper and deeper into unity themes, understanding the greater um, support that unity is and bringing it home with us each week so that we can live better lives. And so I'd like to uh, show you here, we have a lot of great speakers ahead and throughout the year, right to the very end of the year, we are booked fully with awesome speakers. And to introduce you to this week's awesome speaker, Reverend Ogan is back with part three of Radical Acceptance. And thank you, Reverend Ogan, for being here. We're so grateful to have you this time from Washington. We've, we've traveled the country with you and we're very excited to have you back. Uh, thank you. I'm I'm excited to be back. Um, it's a shame I wasn't coming for another week because then next week you'd be you'd be getting me from Morocco. I'm heading out to uh, Morocco later um, today. So yeah, I'm just a, I'm just a traveling fool. Um, but I'm glad I'm glad to be here. Um, can we go ahead and take the that center that picture off so we can uh and there we go perfect um it's good to see you all again um today and um that song was perfect that that uh we just played before the service i don't know who selected that song but give that per give that person a raise um that was that was perfect for uh um uh, this topic and and some of the lines that i captured from the song were uh at the beginning, why am I doing this to myself, uh, losing myself on a tiny error? Um, and there's nothing wrong with with who you are and, and our struggle in this or struggle in why, why do we do this to ourselves? Why do we beat upon ourselves? Why do we guilt ourselves, shame ourselves? Um, and, and we talked about um, being stuck in this trance of unworthiness. So if you were if you missed the previous two talks or you missed one of the talks, um, quick quick recap to bring you up to speed. Make sure we all start in at the same place. Um, in, in, in Buddhist teachings, there's this idea of the trance of unworthiness. And this is a, an ongoing feeling, sensation that I, I'm, I'm not good enough. Um, ooh, Lynn chose a sound. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, perfect choice. Uh, this ongoing feeling that, that that I'm not good enough. That I am. I my 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 human self is not living up to the potential of my uh, my divine self. And and we often get stuck in this idea of also comparing ourselves to others and think others are doing better than we are. Um, I always say comparison is the thief of joy. So let's let's not do it. But that's kind of how we've been wired to. It makes us difficult to trust that uh, we are loved. That we are lovable. Um, and there's this idea that people will will reject us and turn us away if they, if they discover the full truth of who we are, <laughs> that we're that we're not that we're not perfect. Um, and the 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 antidote to this trance of unworthiness, and then also being stuck in fear. We talked about fear being the anticipation of future pain, the anticipation of rejection, the anticipation of something not working out, the anticipation of failure. That we get we get stuck in that trance of fear as well. And the antidote to both of those is radical acceptance. And remember that radical acceptance is not about saying that whatever is happening outside of us, it's okay. So often it gets misinterpreted as that. Radical acceptance is, is the idea of acknowledging what's going on inside of us, our inner experience. It is the inner process of accepting our actual present moment experience. Again, inner process. And um, this radical acceptance has two components to it. There's there's um, mindfulness and compassion. And so far we've we've done a lot of exploration in the mindfulness area. We talked about beginning with the sacred pause because it disrupts our, our habitual behaviors of, of distraction and numbing out and, and bypassing. And when we pause, we can become um, directly of where aware of what is happening in our body in ourselves because it is the body that is the ground of radical acceptance it is the 
body that directs us to the true feelings that are happening um, underneath all the reactions that we're that we're feeling and want to engage in. So in order to begin to awaken from the trance of fear and the trance of unworthiness, we we have to pause, pause, and check in with the body. So today we're going to shift to awakening the compassion within us and compassion um, really means to, to, to be with, to, to feel with, to, to suffer with. Um, um, and we, um, in order to cultivate compassion, we have to stop running from that which brings suffering within us and intentionally bring our attention to it. And that's challenging for a lot of us because it, it can be a painful experience. And like I said before, we are, we are pain averse people. We would, we would rather do what's unhealthy than face the pain of our inner suffering. Um, and how do we begin to show compassion towards ourselves? Um, first of all, we um, step out of self-judgment. And one of the ways we can step out of self-judgment is offer ourselves the same words of kindness and understanding that we give to other people. We are so good at telling people how wonderful and amazing they are. We are so good at telling other people how much of the light of divinity they are and how much of the Christ they are and how it's going to be okay. And they're strong. They have all that they uh, uh, need within them to get to the other side of whatever they're going through. We are so good at doing that for other people. Not as good doing it for ourselves. And maybe we don't believe this about ourselves. But that's, that's the beginning of compassion. What I would say to another, let me say to myself. And, and, and hearing these words projected to ourselves, if you want a real challenge, do it in front of a mirror. But those words projected towards ourselves, it, we, we might feel, again, that disbelief, um, feel like we don't deserve that measure of kindness and understanding. Um, again, feeling unworthy. And there may be some shame around that because, you know, we, we know what we did. We know what we've thought. We know what we believed. We know how we've messed up. We know the mistakes we've made. So, so often we don't um, allow ourselves um, that, 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 that sense of, of, of self-compassion. Some of us actually believe that, that, that we deserve to suffer, that we deserve punishment. Um, and, 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 and to be clear, um, being compassionate towards ourselves does not release us from any responsibility or accountability for our actions. But what it does release us from is the self-hatred that gets in the way of responding with clarity and with balance and, 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 and with love. Um, from the book, um, oh, I got the, I got the book here, uh, Radical Acceptance, Tara Brock, the author, um, she writes this, and this perhaps is, um, the quote that hit home the most for me, because, because this had been my struggle for years and, and a little bit still is. She says this, because we become so addicted to judging and mistrusting ourselves, any sincere gesture of care to the wounded places can bring about transformation. Our suffering becomes a gateway to the compassion that frees our heart. And as our heart transforms suffering into compassion, we experience being both the holder of our sorrows and the vulnerable one who is being held. When we become the holder of our own sorrows, our old roles as judge, adversary, victim, no longer being fueled. When we carry our pain with the kindness of acceptance instead of the bitterness of resistance, our hearts become an edgeless sea of compassion. There's a lot there, so let me, let me break it down piece by piece. That first part, because we become so addicted to judging and mistrusting ourselves, any sincere gesture of care to the wounded places brings about transformation. We are hungry and thirsty for self-compassion. 
we think the most important compassion has to come from outside of ourselves. No, it's from within towards ourselves. We're thirsty for it. We're hungry for it. And just the smallest amount of sincere self-compassion can begin our journey of transformation. And it, it, it frees up our heart, which transforms the suffering into compassion. And then we're in this place of the one holding sorrows and also the one who's being held. So it's a bit of a, of a bit of a paradox. We're carrying the sorrow, the sadness, the heaviness, the suffering, but then we're also holding ourselves like, like a compassionate hug, uh, a, a compassionate cuddle, a supportive, supportive gesture towards ourselves. And when we can carry our sorrows in this way, carry our sorrows while holding ourselves in compassion, then we no longer need to be a judge. We no longer need to be struggling against ourselves. We no longer have to take on that victim consciousness. I don't remember if you uh, uh, know about the four stages of consciousness. Um, there's, there's, there's victim consciousness. Uh, there's um, victor consciousness. There's vessel consciousness, and there's verity consciousness. There's these four phases as our consciousness evolves. And um, and and this model, this model was created by Paul Hasselbeck, who we who we heard from um, a reading earlier. But but in essence, victim consciousness is it's it's happening to me. Right. Everything out there is coming my way. It's everything. It's, it's their fault. Victor consciousness is when we expand, deepen, raise our consciousness a little and, and, and we lay hold of spiritual teachings and we realize the, the ability we have in many ways to shape our experience. And then we be, say it's happening by me. Um, I'm, I'm now the victor. So we go from victim to victor. And then we expand some more and then it be becomes vessel consciousness where we realize, oh, wait, it's, it's not me doing it. It's, it is the divine within me. I am, I am, a, I am a, a vessel, a, a carrier, a container. Um, I embody the divine and, and it is the divine working through me. We become a vessel. But as much as those expansions are, for lack of a better term, improvements, it still misses the mark of verity consciousness which states that it's not that the divine is within me working through me it brings us to the reality that i am the divine the divine is working as me i am one with god and god is one with me it's what jesus said the father and i are one that's verity consciousness that's the epitome of spiritual awakening and we get there through radical acceptance, through mindfulness, and then self-compassion. It is only through self-compassion that we cease being a victim, we cease being a judge, we cease realizing that there is me and the other, that we are all indeed interconnected, interdependent, we're all manifestations of the oneness. Um, to, quote a, to quote another great guru, Bono, we're one, but we're not the same. And then finally, when we carry our pain with the kindness of acceptance, instead of the bitterness of resistance, our hearts become an edgeless sea of compassion. Edgeless sea of compassion. This means there's no limit to the amount of compassion that we can extend first to ourselves and then to others, or vice versa, to others and then to ourselves. It is unlimited. And... and when our, our hearts are open with compassion, we can, we can accept others with compassion. We can accept with compassion those who we don't share similar life views around. And then we can begin to demonstrate that compassion through kindness. Um, when I first um, read this book and prepared a a talk series in this book for uh, Unity on the River. I used to be the minister of that church in Massachusetts. Um, 
couple years ago and I remember as I was uh, reading through this book and and really letting these teachings work with me I, I had the opportunity to practice I was walking out of the grocery store one day and I got to the parking lot and parked next to my car was uh, there was this couple and they, they were in a much older vehicle and I could see the guy was having trouble starting it. You know, his battery's probably dead. There was that click, click, click noise when he tried to start a dead battery. And I was like, Ooh, I can, I can give him a jump start. I think I got cables or maybe he has cables. So I, I call up to him and was like, Hey, you having trouble? You need a jump start. I think I got cables or do you have cables? He's like, yeah, I got cables. And we can do this and 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 he got out of his cars after he got out of his car that I noticed in his back seat was a red make America great again hat and some Trump lawn posters. And right away I went to oh. Here was here was an other right and my first reaction was. Uh oh. And then I thought to myself, huh, had I had seen those first, would I have offered to help? And now that I've seen them, will I continue to help? The second answer was the second question was easier to answer than the first question. I don't know what I would have I don't know what I would have done. But then when I asked myself about if I was going to continue to assist, that answer came easier because I remembered these teachings about compassion, about not being the judge, that there really is no other. There are other points of views, but there really is no other. It doesn't mean, again, we accept all points of views but it means we accept our internal experience that can lead us to compassion. So my internal experience of seeing him as the other was reminding me of how much of myself I see as the other, how much of myself I still have to work towards accepting. So I continue to help, we introduce each other, uh, we spoke for a few minutes and then they drove off and then I drove off. But that first question, if I had seen the hat and the lawn signs first, would I have helped? Remains, remains hanging. I would like to think yes. I would like to think that when the occasion arises again, I will say yes. And perhaps I will because since then, I've done a lot more practice on radically accepting my inner journey, radically accepting that which I'm holding on to that prevents me from, from um, wrapping myself truly in full compassion. So I encourage you to do this for yourself as well, to be the holder of your sorrows and of yourself in an envelope of compassion. I want to do a, a meditation experience right now, but this is this is a fairly um, engaging one, interactive, if you will. Um, so what I'm going to um, invite you to do is 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 learn this practice around bringing th this into your body? How do we begin to make radical acceptance? How do we begin to make mindfulness and compassion and an embodied experience? And why embodied? Because the, the, the body is where we hold our trauma. Trauma is not a, a mental um, condition. It's not even really a psychological condition. It's a physical condition. We hold it in our body. And then our, our body is in many ways in struggle with itself. And, 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 and that affects how we think, how we see, how we believe, how we choose to interact with others. So part of our journey is learning how to, and we talked about this before, settle the body and, and discharge um, that, that trauma energy from our body as well. So um, I'm trying to figure out the best way to do this. So I'll give I'll give instructions first, 
and then we'll spend some time in the silence with you doing it at your own pace. So I think that'll I think that'll work best because everyone will work will move at a at a different pace. So the first part of the meditation um, will I'll, I'll, I'll ground us, I'll settle us, and 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 sort of give instructions, and then we'll go into the silence and and have you do it um, on your on your own. I think that I think that'll work. I think that'll work best. So um, let me invite you before before you close your eyes. Um, again, I know us Unity folks, we hear the word meditation and we close our eyes right away. It's like a Pavlovian response. Um, before you do that, I want to invite you to um, this practice of settling yourself in, in your physical space. So even though you might be in a room that you've been in a hundred times before, I want you to take a moment to look around and notice what's in your space. Look slowly, look purposefully, notice where the windows are. Notice where the doors are. Turn around and see what's behind you. Notice how far over you the ceiling is or how close it is to you. Notice the material on the floor beneath your feet or beneath your chair. What are you sitting in? How does it feel? Notice the objects around you. Notice if they're a little bit different than before. Take a moment to really acclimate yourself to your physical space. This helps settle the body, even if it's a space you've been in hundreds and hundreds of time. You know, many of us have our computer and our Zoom set up in the room and we come to it at the same time and we just mindlessly plop in front of the computer. But mindfulness begins way before we close our eyes for a meditation or a practice. It begins by acclimating ourselves, grounding ourselves in the space. So after you've looked around and notice what's around you, connect with the breath and allow yourself to be more comfortable in that chair and feel the chair support in your back and your, your legs, your body. Allow yourself to be uh, relaxed in the chair, but, but, um, Keeping keeping the body attuned, your attention on the body. And as we continue to breathe, if you're comfortable, now you may close your eyes. If you'd rather keep your eyes open, um, find a spot of few inches in front of you and just have a soft gaze, a relaxed gaze on that spot. And just notice the breath flowing evenly in and out. Notice the pauses between the inhale and the exhale. And as we become even more settled in this moment and in our bodies, what I'm going to invite you to do is a gentle body scan. Don't start yet. Just keep breathing and listening. You're going to start from the crown of your head and slowly let your attention pass down over every part of your body. And as you do this, notice if there are any parts of your body that you feel tightness or a constriction or discomfort of any kind. And when you get to that spot, simply pause, turn your attention even more to it, and start by just hovering your hand over that spot. And hover your hand there for maybe about 30 seconds. And if that's comfortable, then gently rest your hand on the spot for about 30 seconds. And if that's comfortable, just gently rub and massage that spot for about 30 seconds. And then if that's comfortable, give it a gentle squeeze for about 30 seconds. So again, that scan 
Do you find a spot of discomfort? Pause there. Turn your attention to it. You just breathe. We're not thinking anything. We're just simply noticing. Then we hover our hands, our hand for about 30 seconds. If that's comfortable, we touch for 30 seconds. If that's comfortable, gentle rub for 30 seconds. And then even if that's comfortable, we squeeze for 30 seconds, gentle squeeze. And then we continue the body scan. So we're going to do this for a couple of minutes again at your own pace from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet. If we don't get through our entire body, that's okay. You can do this on your own. But let's just center and settle for a few moments, a few minutes as we scan, as we notice, and as we extend a hand of compassion to the places within us in which we are experiencing discomfort. And in this now moment, I affirm for you an awakening, a continual awakening from the trance of unworthiness, from the trance of fear, through radical acceptance, through accepting every moment of your inner experience. Allowing those moments and those places of discomfort to lead you to the places that require compassionate love, compassionate acceptance. And as we continue to awaken to the true fullness of who we are, Fully divine, fully human, fully wonderful, fully amazing. Fully manifestation of the one power and the one presence. We call God, we call love, we call spirit, we call all that is. That this awakening brings us to the fullness of who we are in thought, in word, and in action. This is how we heal the world, by healing ourselves. And so it is, and so we let it be. 
Amen. And namaste.